Welcome to Hot Chips 30. Session 8, Machine Learning 2. Uh, hello, uh, welcome to the second session on machine learning. We have uh, two very exciting talks, one from DeFi and one from Xilinx. I'm, I mean, uh, two from Xilinx. Um, so the, the first uh, talk, uh, there are actually two speakers. Uh, so Song uh, Yao is the CEO and co-founder of DeFi. Uh, before fi founding DeFi, he graduated from uh, uh, the Department of Electrical Engineering at Tsinghua University and did visiting research at Stanford. Uh, the uh, second speaker is uh, Dr. Song Han, who's an assistant professor at MIT and also co-founder of DeFi. Uh, he received his PhD degree from Stanford, uh, advised by uh, Professor Bill Daly. Uh, he proposed deep compression and uh, sparse and an accelerator, which both received uh, best paper awards at ICLR uh, 2016 and FPGA 2017 and widely impacted the industry. Um, uh, these technologies led to DeFi tech uh, that Dr. Han co-founded. All right, let's welcome the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's my great honor to be here again. Uh, so finally, we got a chance to help distinguish between the two sons that co-founded this company, Song Yao and Song Han. Uh, so in the past few years, we have witnessed a lot of changes in algorithm side. Uh, so we have to keep updating our, uh, our deep learning process architecture. So today, uh, my topic is about evaluation, uh, evolution of deep learning uh, accelerators upon the evolution of deep learning algorithms. So here's the list of the contents. So first of all, I will tell what's new about our company, and then I will tell what's the changes inside the algorithm side. And since I also only know the uh, CEO level architecture, so we'll have Song Han to introduce professor level architecture of our deep learning processor. And finally, I will say, uh, I will introduce the changes in software side and, and to summarize this uh, talk. So first of all, what's new about DeFi tech, about our company is that uh, DeFi is now part of Silinx. So we announced the acquisition uh, in last month. So actually, we have a long history together with Silinx. We had a lot of collaboration since uh, we are doing research in Tsinghua University, and since the inception of DeFi, actually we did a lot of uh, research and uh, development on Silinx FPGAs. So we also did a lot of co-sales and co-marketing with Silinx things. So for now, DeFi has uh, 150 employees, and we, has, uh, or we have already signed tens of uh, customers in cloud service, uh, in automotive, and also in video surveillance. So together with Silinx, we are providing turnkey solutions, not only just chips, but also boards, but also IP cores on IPJs, and also our own SDK called DNNDK. And uh, we also support the mainstream uh, deep learning frameworks like Cafe, TensorFlow, and MXNet. We are, we are also providing a lot of reference algorithms uh, and applications for regular surveillance, for auto driving, and for ADAS, and a lot of uh, different applications. So you can also try our uh, IP core on AWS and also Huawei Cloud. We will get this onto Ali Cloud in uh, near future. So you know we have two different can two kinds of different architectures. One is called Aristotle from CNN, and another is called Gcard for RNN and DNN. So the ones on the uh, AWS and the Huawei Cloud is about the LSTM part. It's about speech recognition. So let's go to the second part: the evolution of algorithms. So this year is 2018, and we found a problem that uh, in recent research and industry conferences, people actually are using uh, kind of old algorithms as their benchmark. So even in ISCA or Macro, people are just re referring uh, some old benchmarks, such as uh, Lenet was proposed in 1998, and the most frequently cited uh, algorithms like AlexNet, uh, VGGNet, were proposed in 2012 and 2014. 
and even for Google Net and ResNet, uh, which are kind of complex uh, compared with VGGNet and LXNet, they were proposed in 2014 and 2015. And in the past three years, actually, we have seen that a lot of changes and a lot of evolutions in the algorithm side. So state-of-the-art algorithms are quite complex and quite hard to be accelerated compared with old algorithms. So I'll give you some example. Uh, for example, uh, you must have known that there is a song nonlinear function, or known, known as acti activation function uh, in deep learning. It's called ReLU, re rectified linear unit. So if x is smaller than 0, so y equals to 0. So if x is larger than 0, so y equals to x. So this is widely used, and it has been usually fixed as a, a standard unit inside deep learning accelerator. But so far, another kind of activation function is widely used called p-relu, partial relu. So after, uh, if x is smaller than 0, so y is not 0 anymore. So you, ha you may know that there are two kinds of compression, two kinds of sparsity in deep learning. Uh, one is called weight compression, another is called activa activation compression, which means uh, weight compression means a static pruning and compression, which just prune away the weights inside the new network models. And the activation compression is the pruning, uh, is to do some dynamic sparsity. Because of this ReLU function, any input that is smaller than zero will output a, a zero number. So we can just discard a lot of redundant computations that should be z smaller than zero. But if we are using pReLU, there is no dynamic sparsity. So you cannot save computations using this way. And you can see there are a lot of input channels and output channels in deep learning uh, in CNN. So we will assume that every channel has the same weight, has the same uh, influence and the final output. But the champion of the ImageNet 2017, uh, a network called SENet, they found that actually we may try different weight for different channels. And another concept is called group convolution. So it's not New idea, group convolution is used in AlexNet. That is because GKX580 uh, GPU has not enough memory, so they have to split the network for two parts, two groups. But this idea has been widely used recently, so, but not only two groups, maybe a hundred of groups. So an extreme example is that depth-wise. So you can see if we have 100 input channel and 100 output channel, usually we will connect each input channel with each output channel. So there's 100 times 100 connections. But for depth-wise convolution, we split this convolution layer into 100 groups. So there are only 100 connections. Each input channel is only connected with one output channel. So in this way, actually, we save a lot of computations. But meanwhile, it's very hard to be accelerated. There are also some other changes, for example, uh, for old networks, they're just one by one, right? For the feature map, once it has been used for the following layers, we can just discard it. So it will not be used again. But for a recent network like, like DanceNet, the layers, the feature maps, will be used by all the following layers. So you have to store all intermediate data. You cannot throw it away. And in your imagination, you can see the convolution kernels should be a square, dense, small matrix, right? one by one, or three by three, or five by five convolution kernel. But so far, people found that uh, convolution kernel is related to perception field. The larger it is, you can percept the larger area into the previous feature map. But meanwhile, a five by five convolution kernel leads to 25 melt max, so more computations. So people found that, actually, we can have an area of five by five, but only nine computations. Inside, So it's a sparse convolution kernel. And convolution kernel is not necessarily to be a square one. So it can be any weird uh, size and any weird not rectangle or any, any size. So in this way, actually, if you design your accelerator only to accelerate one by one, three by three, or five by five, it will be hardly used by these uh, software guys. So as mentioned in the keynote yesterday, there is selling talk between software guys and hardware guys. So when they design the algorithms, they will not consider the limitation of hardware. So we have to be adaptable for those new changes. So we have to update our key architecture. 
So please welcome uh, Song Han to introduce part three. Thanks, Song Yao, for introducing the first part of this presentation. And uh, I'm Song Han. I'm going to continue with my uh, tutorial on Sunday when we talk about four generations of deep neural network accelerators from computation specialization to memory-centric specialization. And then we look into the algorithm. How do we change the algorithm to begin with? And then talk about pruning, quantization, and compression before acceleration. And finally, can we design um, efficient ar neural network architecture to start with, and then de co-design the neural network architectures adapting to the new neural network architectures? So in this session, I will talk about how uh, the evolution of DFI CPU with uh, the evolution with the evolution of modern neural networks. Okay, so two years ago, we were on the same stage uh, presenting the first generation of DeFi DPU. Uh, at, during that time, uh, we were using the uh, Zinc 7020 LPGA, achieving a, a, t a peak, peak performance of about 120 giga ops. But at that time, we were only able to process three by three kernels uh, like VGGNet. And then uh, we begin to build the second version of the DPU, which targets more flexible more flexible processor. So we are a processor for a neural network. It's not a specialized, a fully specialized architecture. It works for a domain of applications within deep learning. So it's a domain-specific architecture. So in the second generation, we've switched to a better device, the ZU9, uh, which is 16 nanometer device. And also the peak performance uh, is now 1,003, uh, 1.3 uh, TOPS per second. Uh, but the magic really happens from the second version to the 2.5 version, and I will talk about what is the third version. So from the V2 to V2.5, we uh, doubled the frequency of the DSPs. So the LUT still runs at 333 megahertz, but the DSPs uh, runs at seven, seven, uh, 667 megahertz. And as a result, we can uh, great, uh, reduce the amount of LUTs and memory for a single core. So for a single core, uh, still uh, the giga ops is 1.3 uh, T ops, uh, but now we can fit uh, we can fit three cores on the same piece of ZU9 hardware, and the total uh, peak performance is 4.1 T ops. So on the left hand side shows the first version of the. DPU that we presented two years ago. At that time, we only support three by three convolution, and uh, with the stride of one, um, with uh, but with arbitrary padding size, we also support two by two pooling and uh, uh, ReLU activation function. But neural networks continue to evolve. For example, VGGNet is uh, like 2014. That was met four years ago. And then came different neural network architectures. But uh, in particular, uh, two most important thing is probably the bypass layer uh, that, ResNet, uh, that ResNet introduced. And another operation is probably the batch normalization uh, that was introduced in NIPS 2015. So after that, we continued adapting the DPU architecture to support all these different neural network architectures. So for example, we begin to support uh, the batch normalization. We support them in the compiler to fold them, fold them into the convolution. And some customers require us actually to keep that operation. So we support a separate uh, batch normalization into the instruction set architecture. And also we begin to support uh, the bypass layer, for example, the uh, element-wise operations. And also for pooling, now we support more flexible um, uh, ways of pooling as well. But this is not the end. Um, now um, DPU version 2.5 came. So uh, convolution neural networks uh, not only, only have classification tasks, but we realized in ADAS system, lots of the um, customers actually require detection and segmentation. And for segmentation, uh, one important operation is decomp operation, where you do a comp, decomp, and then so that you can do pixel to pixel uh, transformation. And another cool, uh, important stuff to support is the di dilated convolution. So in uh, segmentation tasks, we need dilated convolution to increase the receptive field of the neural networks so that we can have a larger receptive field. So that is also supported in the 2.5 version of DPU. 
And recently, there's an amazing neural network architecture proposed, which is the mobile net. Mobile net has only 4.2 millions of parameters, but it can achieve a top point accuracy of more than 70% on ImageNet. And, but the key um, operation that the mobile net introduced is the depth-wise convolution. It's different from conventional convolution, where conventional convolution, as shown on the left-hand side, um, it requires a channel-wise reduction, require channel-wise reduction for the input. Uh, that is a good thing for hardware because it increased the ratio between the computation over memory reference. So memory is expensive, computation, uh, memory is expensive, computation is cheap. If we can do more computation on a fixed amount of com uh, off chip communication, that's a good thing. However, uh, this free lunch is no longer, uh, no longer exists, exists for mobile net architecture. So depth wise convolution no longer have uh, this channel-wise reduction. And then re as a result, the ratio between the computation and the communication becomes smaller. And also, um, the other operation that MobileNet has is the one-by-one one convolution. So for one-by-one one convolution, there's very, very little reuse. It's basically, basically a matrix vector multi multi matrix, matrix multiplication. Unless convolution, it has less reuse. So um, the way we did that is to fuse these two layers. So after the convolution, uh, the, the depth-wise convolution is finished, rather than having to physically store the weights into off-chip DRAM, materialize that, materialize that as the previous DPU do, um, we f just put them on on-chip block RAM and then pipeline it to the next layer by fusing these two layers. So conventionally, we have to materialize in DRAM. Now we put them in on-chip on block RAM, no longer uh, put them on DRAM, which save the memory bandwidth. So this is a comparison um, about mobile net version one, mobile net version two, normalized to the ResNet 50. So the message I'm trying to convey in this slide is that, so compared with ResNet 50, uh, mobile net version one, the model size reduced by six times. The flops reduced by 6.8 times. However, running on GPU, the, uh, the latency only get re reduced by three times. So theoretically, we want the same amount of uh, time to be reduced compared with the uh, re reduction of the flops. So, and even worse for mobile, mobile net version two. So mobile net version two, um, it, the computation gets reduced by 12.9 times. So ideally, we want the, the timing, the latency, also to be reduced by 12.9 times. But actually, it only gets reduced by 2.8 2 times. So that is inherently the inefficiency of the uh, new model architecture. Not necessarily um, less number of flops directly translate to the saving of the latency. But by using uh, the DPU architecture, um, let's see this figure also about the ratio between uh, ResNet 50 and also the mobile net. So it's, uh, the reduction of the flop is the same. It's six point, roughly 6.8 times, uh, but the saving of the time is 4.9 time, times. It's a little higher. However, if we see the utilization of mobile net, it's still very low, only 28.6% compared with VGG. Uh, VGG16, which is 87.3%. So it still have a low utilization compared with other neural network architectures. So how do we, how do we solve this problem? And where is the problem coming from? So this is a detailed profiling results on the DPU for, on the left-hand side is the VGG16, which is the easiest neural network architecture to start with. And this is the CTC ratio of mobile time version one. CTC here is short for off-chip communication over computation. So more communication over commu computation means it's more expensive to do uh, the off-chip memory access and may make it slower. So actually for VGG uh, 16, we saw there's a lot of reuse. There's plenty of reuse. So the CCT CTC ratio is actually very low less than 0 0.02 is the ratio. However, on the right-hand side, uh, for mobile net version one, 
uh, the ratio, uh, the CTC ratio is pretty high. Um, for example, some of the depth-wise, uh, the depth-wise convolution is one over nine, that's roughly 0 0.11. So the CTC ratio is much higher than the VGG net. So that's the reason why there's a low utilization for uh, mobile net version, uh, version one or version two on the DPU and other hardware architectures. So in order to solve this problem, in order to solve this problem, uh, we put a specialized PE to deal with the one-by-one -one convolution. So remember, the problem comes from the fact that we have lots of memory, a uh, higher ratio between memory access versus computation. So the solution is to reduce the amount of memory access as much as possible. So the idea is to pipelining and uh, reduce, uh, put the weight, intermediate weight, intermediate weight in on-chip block RAMs rather than materializing them onto the off-chip DRAM. So this is a, a final result after before and after adding uh, this technique. So for VGG, uh, original the, uh, utilization is 80, 80, 87. For Inception version one, the utilization is 30, 36. For Resident 50, the utilization is 39. And for mobile net version one, before such optimization uh, of layer fusing, the um, utilization is 28.6. And after the uh, optimization, the utilization uh, increased to 45%, increased to 45%. This is still not, not enough, right? We have 100, how, how can we achieve 100% utilization or as close uh, to 100% utilization? So uh, we experiment, did, did a simulation to increase the, the block RAM to, from one megabyte to two megabytes, and then we can increase this utilization to 63.9%. So if future uh, Zenix LPGAs can provide us uh, doubling the number of block RAMs, we can easily increase uh, the, the utilization. All right, this concludes my part of the presentation, and I will handle uh, this to Song Yao again. All right, I'm back. So let me introduce, I think there are three changes in recent software for deep learning. Uh, first of all, uh, your customers are not the developers who can write low-level code. So they just know how to write some Python code or just run some simple neural networks. So you have to provide a lot of full-stack software for them. So you can see we're providing not only compiler, but also we embed compression tools inside our compiler. And we have preset a lot of settings and parameters. So our users can just choose the user scenario, and our tool will help them to compress their networks. And besides, we, can, we should also provide more and more so software frameworks for different applications, for example, automotive, uh, video surveillance. And second one is that uh, we must consider a lot of optimization into compiler to do a lot of fusion and decomposition. Uh, for example, there are several typical serial layers like uh, convolution, pruning, uh, so we can fuse them together. And in some cases, we have to decompose them because the pool can be shared by two different convolution layers. So we have measured that, uh, in general, we can achieve 20% higher performance if, you, uh, if we fully use all these uh, optimization strategies. And besides, I think there, the bottleneck sometimes doesn't come from the chip itself. For example, if you are doing some video surveillance uh, projects, you will find sometimes bottleneck is USB interface or uh, some BT1120 or other video interface. So we have to optimize the embedded software as a whole. So in this way, we can achieve the optimum performance with your chip for different applications. So in summary, uh, we found that algorithms are evolving fastly. And so uh, the newest state-of-the-art models, they're designed to be efficient but not friendly to new hardware. So we have to consider the, uh, to update our hardware, to update our architecture. So we approached the fusing layer strategy together with compiling optimizations to optimize uh, the depth-wise and point-wise convolution and together with a lot of different new tasks. So in general, I found that we also want to achieve a trade-off between performance and also flexibility. So a way to do this is to have a general purpose processor adding some specialized, specialized IB cores, uh, such as adding some tensor cores, DLA inside, 
And another way to do it is, I think it's through FPGA, uh, to use some adaptable platform. So you can see for Xilinx, uh, they have XDNN, which is optimized for large chip for high performance uh, situations. And they also acquired us, our IP cores, uh, utilize, uh, optimized for lower uh, resource utilization to feed for small chips and for short latencies. So we, we can use this for different user scenarios and to optimize it for different cases. So in general, I think in this period, the algorithms are still evolving. So we cannot overlook the gap between designing the chip and the chips tip out. So I think FPGA can truly play a big role in this area. So thank you for this, today's talk. All right, questions? I'm from SK Telecom. Uh, does your EPU take advantage of structure sparsity? If so, which kind of sparsity do you use? Okay, so actually we have two kinds of IP cores. Uh, one is called Aristotle for CNN, and for, us, for this one, uh, for recent V2.5, we only take, uh, make use of course level sparsity, kernel level sparsity, and for the another IP core called Descartes for RNN and DNN, uh, we make full use of uh, pixel level sparsity. Uh, CNN use kernel level sparsity. Pardon? Uh, kernel in CNN, you use yeah, because you, you found that for CNN, the metric size is much smaller, right? One by one, three by three, or five by five. But for RNN LSKM, the metric size can be 1K by 2K. So we use different strategies. Hi, uh, Daquan King from NVIDIA. Is there um, any special optimization because it is based on the um, FPGA, not on ASIC? Uh, yeah, so actually in the um, architecture part, let's go to DPUV 2.5, you can see there is a SVP designed for uh, special utilization, for example, depth-wise. So during the compilation part, we will analyze how many depth-wise depth and point-wise layers inside, so we will allocate different resources for different PEs. So maybe one SPE and 16 traditional PE, or two SPE and 15 traditional PE. What about the bit precision for all of the benchmark? Pardon? Uh, bit precision for all of the benchmark? Oh, the precision, yeah. I, I promised to talk, talk about version three. So we are going to f support the flexible number of bits as we hinted in the Sunday's tutorial to use auto ML to search the optimal number of bits per layer. As it turned out, not all of the layers require eight bits. Some of them you can get by with uh, four bits or maybe even two bits. So uh, by uh, reusing the DSPs, we can uh, achieve a flexible number of bits in the hardware side, and by using AutoML, we can support that from the uh, tool chain or the algorithm side. And another part of the uh, version three, as I promised to talk about, is support large batch uh, inference on the cloud. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Stephen Huang from Amazon. I have a question about the prioritize. Actually, you mentioned about a lot, but recently, actually, prioritize is no longer actually in the light. So what, what do you think uh, prioritize those kind of compression scheme or work in your f future actual generation? Thank you. Um, could you elaborate the question? method, like uh, you actually uh, find a neighborhood and then use the number to present those uh, approximate numbers. So the prioritize actually is in your paper, right? Prioritize. 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 Like a, a paralyzed. A paralyzed. Yeah, look up table. Oh, oh yeah. Um, yeah, I talk about the coarse grain pruning and the structured sparsity. That must be answered, be able to answer a question to have coarse grain sparsity and structured pruning so that you can have uh, like CMD units to process a, co um, a chunk of non-zeros. Uh, I mean the look LUT those kind of I think he's scheme, a right? Question. I think you mean the lookup table? We are uh, we are not using it into our uh, real product. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's a good point. 
when you talk about clustering, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Oh, yeah, so we did, uh, don't have that implementation here. We use linear quantization, 8-bit linear quantization. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Let's uh, thank the speakers again. Yeah, yeah. thank you. All right, our second presentation uh, is from Xilinx. Rahul <coughs> Nimayar is the director of data center IP solutions at Xilinx. He leads the machine learning IP uh, solutions, including development of Xilinx deep neural network IP, targeting cloud and data center. Um, Rahul has 21 years of experience in the semiconductor industry. He has a bachelor's from IIT Kragpur and has an MBA from, uh, from Kellogg. Thank you, Ian. Uh, first of all, it's my pleasure to uh, have an opportunity here to share and present the work done by an exceptional team at Xilinx across hardware, software, architecture, and uh, <clears throat> CTO office. So thank you to everyone, the folks who are listed here and some who are not. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, Xilinx inference engine, uh, which is a combination of the DNN processor, which has been optimized to run on Xilinx FPGA, and the software tools, the compiler and runtime, which comes associated with it. And what it allows you to do is take a trained network model, run it through our compiler and runtime, and then deploy it on Xilinx DNN processor mapped to Xilinx FPGAs. And what, should, uh, what do you get out of it? You get low latency and high throughput at batch equal to one. So you don't need to batch to get throughput and compromise on latency. We get 60 to 80% efficiency across networks, uh, across different kind of networks, that's uh, ResNet, uh, Google Net V1, and Inception V3, and so on. Uh, once again, at uh, batch equal to one. And most importantly, uh, you can do that without uh, knowing anything about FPGAs. So you don't need to know uh, how to program FPGA. You don't need to know how to write RTL. Uh, you can be in your Python world and still uh, deploy this for your uh, inference. Before I get into uh, the DNN uh, processor, a uh, uh, couple of uh, uh, items on uh, all the work which I'll present here, uh, all the matrix and everything has been implemented on uh, Vertex Ultrascale 9P, VU 9P device. Uh, 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 it's a 16 nanometer uh, FinFET device from Xilinx, uh, uh, 2.5 uh, million system logic cells, uh, around 7,000 DSPs, and uh, 382 uh, megabits of on-chip SRAM. And I'll go deeper into that, uh, how effectively we utilize this on-chip SRAM to get the efficiency and to uh, get the uh, low latency at batch equal to one. And uh, the board which was used to do uh, was uh, based on VU 9P, uh, VCU 1525, our reference board design. Uh, uh, and so, uh, uh, we'll, uh, so all the results have been uh, measured on this board. So I, uh, I want to talk a little bit, uh, what are the different factors uh, which we believe, uh, which basically uh, suit uh, mapping deep learning on FPGA. And uh, I think, the number of posters which I saw outside, I don't think uh, uh, I need to even talk about this. Uh, but if you look at any of the DNA networks, right, one of the thing is uh, there are billions of uh, operations. A lot of operations can be done in parallel. And what it means is that uh, you need a lot of processing elements with uh, high efficient memory uh, next to it so that you can feed uh, them and do uh, uh, all the computers in parallel. The second thing is, if you look at it, right, a lot of the data uh, gets reused. So basically, uh, the weight filters gets reused. The output from one, uh, one layer becomes input to the next layer. And so what it means is that you, have, you want to make sure that you have compute uh, uh, close to memory so that you don't spend time uh, on moving data around. And you can do a lot of things in a pipeline fashion instead of going back to memory every time. And, We'll talk uh, more about uh, when I go into the DNN architecture. And the last thing is there has been a lot of research going on, and a lot of things have already been proven uh, that, at, for inference, uh, lower precision uh, is being uh, deployed 8-bit uh, without 
a significant loss in accuracy, but uh, a lot of uh, saving in uh, power and bandwidth and so on. And at the same time, there's a lot of research going on to further figure out uh, what is the best, uh, uh, what are the different uh, uh, optimal uh, bit widths which is possible for different applications, and what uh, FPGAs allow you to natively provide any precision, and you can do any compute. Uh, and as a result, it becomes very friendly for uh, DNN application. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, memory hierarchy, simply because uh, we have uh, uh, used it very efficiently on our DNN processor design. And uh, so if you, if you look at the UltraScale Plus FPGA, uh, there is a range of memory hierarchy, it's starting with uh, distributed uh, RAM, which is uh, small RAMs distributed across FPGAs, uh, very close to uh, the compute DSP elements. Uh, and uh, uh, on VU 9P, there's 36 megabits of it available, amounting to roughly 600 terabit uh, per second of bandwidth. The next level of memory hierarchy is block RAM, uh, slightly uh, bigger uh, RAM than distributed RAM uh, in blocks of 36 kilobyte. Uh, once again, distributed in columnar fashion across FPGA. Uh, uh, a, a truly dual-ported uh, block RAM with a lot of uh, configurability in terms of uh, width and depth. Uh, once again, uh, so uh, this is ordered in terms of uh, higher capacity and uh, uh, lower bandwidth. The next is Ultra RAM, uh, which is the next uh, uh, set of memory hierarchy available on Ultra Skill Plus device. It's much bigger than block RAM uh, in terms of density per unit block. Uh, once again, it's distributed uh, in a uh, columnar fashion across that PGA. And uh, on BU 9P, uh, you have uh, 270 megabits of this uh, RAM available on chip. And uh, on top of these two, we have, uh, based on the uh, device which you use, we also have HBM uh, on package on 37P, as well as DDR4 uh, uh, on board. So this whole memory hierarchy, what it allows you to do is build your custom memory hierarchy suited for the uh, problem at hand, uh, optimizing for bandwidth, latency, multi-port, throughput, and so on. And as we'll go uh, deeper into the, uh, our DNN process architecture, I'll allude uh, back to some of these. So what is uh, uh, Xilinx DNN processor? Uh, this is the high-level block diagram, uh, and I'll go uh, into each one of these blocks. Uh, but at a high level, it's a configurable overlay processor. And what it means is that it has been designed as an overlay, uh, uh, I think, um, in the keynote, uh, uh, Victor talked about domain-specific architecture, so uh, an overlay associated with that. So uh, this is an overlay processor which gets mapped onto the FPGA. And once you map it, once you program it, you don't need to reprogram the FPGA. Uh, this uh, particular overlay processor has been designed specific for DNN. So the instruction set is DNN-specific. Uh, it's highly configurable. Uh, and. Uh, we can run uh, any network, uh, any uh, image size, any input feature map. There is no restriction on that. And we'll go uh, more on how we do that. Uh, we have optimized this to fit the underlying FPGA uh, fabric. And as a result, uh, we achieve very high frequency and very high compute uh, efficiency when we run uh, networks on this. And the most important thing is uh, you can compile and run uh, networks from uh, 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 popular uh, ML frameworks like TensorFlow and CAFE and so on without actually reprogramming that PG or changing the bit stream. So let's go deeper uh, into the architecture. So the first we'll go uh, into what is the systolic array. So basically it's a uh, 2D uh, channel parallel uh, compute elements uh, along with uh, distributed weight buffers. I think uh, Ian was talking earlier about the ARM, and uh, he alluded to the same fact, the channel parallel architecture. And this, our uh, systolic array is also channel parallel. Uh, if I basically zoom into it, what it is is there are all these processing elements which are mapped on the DSP blocks, so which is a uh, uh, 27 by 18 multiply accumulate, uh, along with uh, weight buffer. So the distributed RAM, which I talked about, are in close physical proximity with these DSP blocks, and those RAMs are used as uh, weight cache um, 
to uh, store the weight and then feed it to the DSP block. Uh, we use this, uh, we have built this weight buffers in a ping pong architecture. So basically, we uh, uh, get the weights from DDR on, on ping and start doing convolution and then while we load the other set of, uh, set of weights. The DSP block has been uh, uh, optimized, so in integer, so we support both uh, integer 8 and integer 16, and the way we have built it is that in integer 8 mode, we map basically two 8-bit multiply and add on each of the, uh, each of the, uh, the DSP block. Uh, we have partisan it in a way that we run the, uh, the compute, the multiply accumulate, at 2x the clock, whereas we run the memory at 1x uh, the clock. And it allows us to basically really achieve very high frequency on the, uh, uh, on the uh, multiply accumulated black, which are cascaded uh, along the columns. So in terms of uh, channel parallel, so the input feature maps are basically fed to the rows uh, in a channel parallel way. And the columns map to the uh, to output uh, output feature maps. So in 8-bit mode, in every uh, 1x clock, we feed four weights to the DSP block, and then DSP block basically in the faster clock domain uh, does to uh, multiply and add. So basically, if you look at this thing, uh, when we did the architecture of it, we wanted to make sure that. Uh, we optimize it and uh, make sure it fits uh, well on the uh, underlying FPGA, FPGA fabric. Next, uh, talk about uh, the tensor memory, which sits uh, next to the systolic array. Uh, so it basically holds the input feature map and output feature map, so I'll call those activations. So it holds the activation, and once again, it's channel parallel. So uh, each of the row of the systolic array is associated with a uh, row of uh, 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 memory. And this sensor memory is, uh, in this implementation, we have mapped it to uh, ultra-RAM, which, uh, which I talked about uh, earlier, uh, the third level of memory hierarchy. And uh, one of the good things here is that on one side it's channel parallel, on the other side uh, it's multi-ported, so it's uh, concurrent access. So what it allows us to do is Basically, on one side, I can read from this tensor memory to the systolic array, do compute, while on the other side, I can be you know, writing back to the DDR if needed, or bringing in uh, the next set of, uh, next uh, uh, layer if, if needed. So basically, or we also have a, process, a parallel processing block which does some of the other operations, so we can read from the same memory uh, to that parallel processing block as well. So uh, in an effect, right, it's a very high bandwidth uh, multi-ported uh, tensor memory which, is, uh, which gets uh, used. One of the thing is that we talked about it, uh, there is a lot of on-chip memory available, and um, the way we uh, normally do uh, when we uh, process uh, this DNN, uh, we try to keep the activations on-chip, and we stream the weights as needed. So uh, let's say I'm running ResNet 50, and once I get the, uh, let's say, input image, which is, uh, let's say I'm doing a regular 224 by 224 by 3, so I get that activation, uh, and then I basically uh, process the first layer, write the output back to the uh, tensor memory, and keep each of these input and output layer uh, on, on chip without going back to, the, uh, back to the DDR. And that is what allows us to actually achieve uh, really, really uh, low latency as well as high utilization of, uh, of, the, uh, of, of, of this engine. So I'll just uh, uh, briefly talk about uh, the uh, memory utilization. And so I show on the left uh, a typical uh, uh, graph, uh, uh, and uh, you have parallel, uh, uh, parallel branches, uh, uh, one by one con uh, convolution, three by three, and then uh, basically three by three convolution. So what I show here is that, uh, let's say in the tensor memory, uh, the output from the previous layer, which is input to this, has, was stored, uh, uh, shaded green. Uh, we do the first compute, read uh, that data from the memory, write it. Um, then we read uh, and then do the next three by three con. Now uh, we read from that three by three con, 
and do a three by three convolution. So the output of that gets written in the red. And basically, uh, uh, the compiler schedules this, and I'll talk about that. And at this point, if you see uh, the address space where the three by three convolution output was written is available now to be utilized for the next uh, next set of uh, output. So uh, this kind of just shows that we continue to do that. And as a result, now at the end of it, uh, the output of all these three different branches, just through memory uh, uh, address generation, uh, gets concatenated and now becomes the input to the next layer. And now the previous layer output, which was the input for this layer, is now available to be, to be reused. So how do we use it? Uh, so one of the things is that uh, we have built an entire uh, uh, middleware and software tools and API, which allows you to uh, basically have uh, direct uh, connectivity to the uh, uh, frameworks. And right now, currently, we support TensorFlow, Cafe, and MXNet. So what, uh, what our uh, tool chain does is you give the train model and the weights. Uh, so it takes the graph, let's say you are in TensorFlow, so it will take the tensor graph, converts into a Xilinx uh, graph, and then basically uh, does uh, a few optimizations, and I'll talk about a couple of them. Uh, then it goes to the compiler, and compiler generates all the instruction sets which are needed to basically uh, run that network on the DNN processor. Uh, in addition, we have a, a quantizer, which uh, you normally run offline. And uh, so you feed the uh, floating point 32 uh, bit weight, strain weights to that quantizer, and a few uh, set of images uh, which are used for calibration to find the range. Uh, and then uh, it then generates an 8 bit quantized uh, uh, weights. And then the runtime actually manages uh, all the communication between CPU and FPGA. So this whole compiler runtime is available on GitHub, uh, and uh, you can try it. So the first thing, uh, one of the things which uh, the uh, compiler does is basically uh, graph optimization uh, and graph partitioning. So once we get a graph, a lot of the time, uh, you'll always have some pre-processing and some post-processing. So the graph optimizer actually breaks into, into multiple subgraphs, and it allows us to do multiple things. It allows us to run the different parts of the graph on uh, 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 different uh, core, if, if you have, let's say, if you have mapped multiple DNN cores, or you can run some part on the, FPG, uh, on the CPU, we have uh, on embedded CPU or the host, and uh, or it also allows us to basically uh, deploy, uh, run these different subgraphs across, uh, across multiple uh, chips. We also do uh, fusing of operation, and uh, what it means is basically, uh, uh, once we access the activation once, uh, we do the convolution, and all the uh, batch normalization on ReLU and MaxPole are then basically as fused as pipelined operators, and then they are just executed on the uh, pipeline operators without going back to uh, the uh, tensor memory. So we save a lot of... Uh, 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 so we don't have to go back and uh, re-access the memory, which is, uh, which is always uh, high cost. We also have something, uh, instruction parallelism. So in, in addition to the systolic array, we have a block uh, which can do a lot of the uh, uh, other processing, for example, element-wise addition or max pool. And if the network graph allows, the compiler can actually schedule uh, a parallel instruction. So you might be doing convolution on the systolic array, and then a, uh, for example, uh, Google Net V1 has something called pool projection, so that pool projection can be mapped to the processing, uh, the parallel processing block, which is uh, doing the, uh, which would be doing the uh, 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 pooling. So basically, once again, uh, it, uh, uh, it helps us uh, reduce the overall latency and uh, utilize, uh, utilize the uh, resources. The other important thing is that uh, a lot of the benchmarks and all those things are always based on 224 by 224 by 3, but uh, most of the real applications and most of the things which we see uh, uses high-resolution images. And one of the things which uh, our DNN uh, processor does is basically uh, it, it maximizes the on-chip memory. So if the input feature layer map does not 
completely fit on, on chip memory, it will basically tile it across width and height. And uh, we have uh, hardware-assisted tiling, and what it means is basically compiler uh, will just have one instruction that, okay, do convolution on this entire, uh, entire input feature map. And then hardware knows that, okay, I can only fit this much. So it will do the tiling. It knows uh, how to schedule these uh, uh, sub-instructions, when to start the download, when to start the upload from DDR, because now it's not fitting on chip, so we are getting the uh, input feature maps from, uh, from memory. So it allows us to kind of not limit it to, um, we can run uh, any feature map size on this processor, irrespective of uh, uh, the processor resources, whether we build a small uh, or a large one. Uh, basically, uh, some, uh, some of the key functions uh, which the uh, processing engine supports. And uh, uh, I, I, don't, I won't go through uh, basically each one of them, but what it shows is that uh, we support the, the wide range of both rectangular and square kernel size and uh, different kind of uh, 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 activation functions and um, upsampling and dilated convolution, and which allows us to map uh, any, any network which uh, utilizes uh, any of these instruction set. Uh, in terms of the network support, uh, we do support all the classification, uh, segmentation, and object detection networks, as well as any custom network where the uh, functions are uh, mapped to one of the instructions which we, which we support. So the next one uh, kind of shows uh, the, uh, one of the implementations. So uh, it's a uh, uh, programmable uh, processing engine. So uh, the implementation which I show here, uh, the array was uh, 96 by 16, so 96 rows and 16 columns of phys physical columns of uh, DSP arrays. And uh, so uh, it's view 9P, so uh, one engine mapped to each one of uh, each one of the SLR, and uh, if you uh, look at it, because of the way uh, we have optimized the architecture, because of the way we use the distributed uh, weights across the DSP, the way we use the cascading of the DSPs, that we actually unlock uh, the 90% of device at max. So we can we run the uh, DSP blocks at 800 megahertz and the rest of the logic at uh, at 400 megahertz. This one shows uh, for uh, one of the network, um, the efficiency which we get, Google Net V1, at batch equal to one, 74% uh, 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 efficiency. And uh, so across the networks, so we have run many different networks, we get a, a compute efficiency of anywhere 60 to 80%. Uh, uh, I don't have uh, all the benchmark data today. Uh, we are launching uh, this uh, IP as a product, uh, this version, uh, in XDF uh, in October. So we'll have all the benchmark data uh, at, at that time. In addition to uh, one of the most other powerful thing is that this uh, uh, DNN uh, processing engine is kind of a modular block. And you can have one or multiple of these. So uh, you can have uh, three of these mapped to VU9P. All three can be running one network to give you the max throughput. All three can be running different network based on your uh, requirement. Or you can basically uh, integrate it with your uh, custom application. So uh, I think uh, 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 as we have talked about that machine learning is by itself is not just application. It's kind of getting integrated with a lot of different uh, applications. And this one one uh, shows uh, uh, XDNN uh, basically integrated with one of the uh, uh, intelligent video analytics pipeline. So you can have a kernel um, which does video decode and pre-processing, feed that data to the XDNN processor, and then feed the data to a pre-processing and encode. So uh, basically, what it uh, allows you to do is integrate it with custom application, whether it's database or genomics pipeline, and uh, uh, accelerate the entire application or as much of it as you can to uh, get uh, much uh, uh, lower end-to-end -end latency. So in summary, uh, we have built a, a DNN processing engine uh, which has been optimized for ultra-scale plus uh, FPGA fabric. Uh, you get an efficiency of 60 to 80% across networks. Uh, the architecture unlocks 90% of the uh, uh, device F max. 
Uh, and the most important thing is, uh, once again, you don't need to know anything about FPGA. Uh, you can uh, run this, and you can compile and run uh, any network from uh, TensorFlow Cafe or MXNet, and uh, you can run it on cloud, uh, AWS F1, or you can uh, deploy uh, in PCI cards. For additional information, uh, please uh, join us for Xilinx uh, Developer Forum, which is uh, at three different locations, and San Jose, it's October 1 and 2. Thank you. Question here on the left. Hi, this is Kiran. I'm from Western Digital Research. So on the slide 16, you showed that you can get to 90% of the FMAX, and at the same time, you're using 50% of the LUCs. So are you able to add like another application on the top of it? Because you're using almost 80% of the VRAMs. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so I think uh, the example on slide uh, 16 uh, is basically Yeah, so the example uh, is uh, three XGN kernels on each of the, each of the SLR. So this is, uh, this is uh, maximized for the compute element. So yes, you have, uh, so the DNN engine, right, it's driven by the DSP element. So if you see, we already utilize 80% of the DSP and 92% of the uh, on-chip uh, uh, URAM. So it's optimized for that. So if you want to do, uh, a different, uh, so let's say you want to add some other application, so you might map just two engines and keep the, uh, instead of mapping the third engine, you map your custom applications there. Got it, got it. So then the other related question is on the next slide, slide 17. So that 74% probably is not a right number, right? Because you're using only the 50% like of the FPGA, and because you're getting a max frequency because you have a lot of space in between for the routing. So, 70, uh, so the efficiency here is the compute efficiency okay. of the design, so uh, not of the LUTs. So, so basically, uh, efficiency here is the goodness of the design. So I have this many DSP elements which can run at this frequency, so it gives me n number of ops per second. Now, if I run a network, yes. how many ops I'm getting? So it, it's 74% it's is that. Yes not related to the LUT utilization. Yes, yes, I completely understand. The question is that because you have almost 50% free space in FPGA, I'm arguing that you get the, the 800 megahertz because of the free space in FPGA. So if you start using the entire FPGA, you won't hit the 800 megahertz. Yeah, so, so basically, right, on, uh, if, if you look at, right, the value prop of FPGA is basically uh, uh, integrating other applications to it as well. So uh, in that regard, right, we, we, we talk about the efficiency of the design and not the device. But yeah, I'm, I get your point. Yeah, thank thank you. you. You're here again on the left. Uh, hi, here's Burian from Autonomous Intelligent Driving. So um, I mean, a lot of um, research and work is ongoing in the community developing new network topologies and new activation functions and so on. So I'm wondering about your strategy, how you keep on track on that new features, for example, new activation functions like scale ELU or so on to be supported on your platform. Sorry, uh, it was not very clear. Yeah, for, um, I mean, for example, when new activation functions, functions are upcoming, right? So how about your strategy to support that um, new activation functions? Do you have the possibilities for example, that the customer can write some custom layers for supporting that, or how about your strategy? Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, yeah, so there are two aspects to it, right, is uh, uh, if you're talking about some, uh, some, some custom, uh, some new activation function or something, let's say, which does not map uh, onto the systolic array or any of the block which you have, so yes, it could be, uh, it could be an additional pipeline block which you need to map on that PGA or you can basically uh, uh, run that on CPU uh, while uh, th that gets done. But yeah, th those are the two options which you have. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Let's go here on the right. Hi, uh, 
a quant from the NVIDIA. The Jilinx today mentioned about 7 nanometer Everest, which is a 20 times better performance compared to 16 nanometer Jilinx product. So is this compared to this one, the 16 nanometer XDNN, or so can I interpret the 7 nanometer peak performance can be about 400 teraflops? So, uh, so basically, yeah, so the, the XDNN, right? Uh, this XDNN is mapped to the FPGA fabric on 16 nanometer, and we'll also have XDNN mapped to the Everest device on the, uh, on the hardware software programmable engine, which was talked earlier by Juan Ho. So uh, there will be an engine which will map to that fabric. So yes, the performance uh, increases based on that, that if this engine gets mapped there. All right, let's thank the speaker. Okay, thank you.